I want to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Kai Chan is from the University of British Columbia, where he is Canada Research Chair and an Associate Professor in the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability. He describes himself on his webpage as an interdisciplinary, problem-oriented sustainability scientist trained in ecology, policy, and ethics from Princeton and Stanford universities. I, I like that, it's concise. In fact, and the scientist in the audience will understand the significance of this, gained his PhD in the lab of Dr. Simon Levin at Princeton, and he was a postdoc with Drs. Paul Ehrlich and Gretchen Daly, Gretchen Daly at Stanford. This is significant people in his background, so we're expecting a lot from him. <laughs> he also managed, as a PhD student, to squeeze in being a policy fellow and doing some ethics training with Peter Singer. He's also clever enough, I discovered on his website, to name his research lab Chan's Lab. Now you may have noticed that Elena Bennett names her lab the Bennett Lab. In fact, you can find it at bennettlab.whatever on the web. And lots of scientists do that. But Chan's Lab is not Kai Chan's Lab. It is, and I'm going to get it correct here, it is the Connecting Human and Natural Systems Lab. <laughs> to all of which I can only say, wow. <laughs> anyway, in his research, which is the important thing, Kai strives to understand the workings of and the values associated with social ecological systems in order to facilitate decision-making that promotes human well-being and social and ecological justice. And his talk today is titled, towards a future both better and wilder, harmony through small planet ethics. Please welcome Kai Chan. It's a real pleasure to be here today. This has been the most exciting and stimulating event that I've been a part of in a long time. It's, um, you know, it's gonna be great on the one hand to follow Bob and then Elena with their talks um, because what I'm going to talk to you about is going to rely on what they talk to you about with climate change and ecosystem services. Um, it's also in some ways unfortunate to follow up on Elena's talk because whereas I felt like I had a thousand things I wanted to tell you and I decided that I would start with the highest level, thinking about global systems and what we actually have to do to turn those systems around. So, whereas Elena's starting off with her research, building up from what she knows, I'm starting off with the biggest, most difficult questions and going way out on a limb, and you'll see who stands on firmer footing. <laughs> I'm actually gonna start with chamber pots. Um, because, you know, if, if we're talking about better, you should lower the bar, right? start low and you can only get better than chamber pots, right? So the story of chamber pots is an interesting one. Although the Romans and the Greeks both had pretty sophisticated plumbing systems, those were lost soon after the empire has crashed and through the dark ages there was a heavy reliance on chamber pots which were disposed of in city streets in gutters and then later cesspools, open gutters, that relied upon rainwater to wash that feces and urine, I'm you know, making sure that it's a low bar here, um, through the cities, right? With all of the smell and the health risks that go along with that. The reason I tell you this is because people didn't act that way because they wanted to. They didn't want to expose people to their own waste in those kinds of ways. And it was just normal to do so. Until all of a sudden, along came sophisticated plumbing systems, which actually took ages to get them implemented. But when they came in, there was no big fight. There were no huge taxes for people who didn't want to use them, right? 
There was no major campaign to get people to sit on the new toilets that had plumbing, right? It just happened as a matter of course. And so what I'm going to talk to you about is small planet ethics. As I'll say later, not, finger, not through individual finger wagging, but through the creation of systems that work for people, that enable people to act in ways that work for the planet. So first, though, in terms of the starting darker, I'm going to point out that environmentally at the moment we're basically in the dark ages. Whereas in the developed world we like to think of, you know, when we think of tropical hardwood we think of beautiful furniture like this or hardwood floors. I'm going to argue that on the other hand we also ought to be thinking about landslides that claim so much life and property in Haiti, Indonesia, lots of other tropical countries the loss of tropical biodiversity associated with forests, and the sedimentation and degradation of coral reefs downstream. You know, and where you could argue that in some of these places the landslides are caused in part due to illegal logging, there's been lots of scapegoating of that nature, and it's a local issue, they shouldn't be logging illegally. The problem is that we are all complicit in that, even the illegal logging, which none of us would like to, but if you've ever bought tropical hardwood lumber, you have incidentally, almost certainly, contributed to illegal logging because it's impossible, or has been impossible, up until FSC, the Forest Stewardship uh, Council certification system of the last few years, to actually trace these logs through the chain of custody. custody. It's a complicated problem. So we're complicit in that problem. When we think about transportation, we think about you know, flying on a jet airplane like I did to get here, or this car of my dreams which I will never, ever, ever drive, <laughs> or remembering that I'm in cottage country, jet skis. But we should also be thinking about climate refugees, like this woman from Tuvalu, um, which is one of those low-lying tropical islands in the Pacific that's becoming inundated with sea level rise that Bob talked about earlier. Or climate refugees of another kind with flooding here in Africa. These are Somalian refugees crossing a river um, to get to territory where they can actually inhabit it um, in Kenya. Or the forest fires that came right up to the city of Santa Barbara, which is a beautiful city, too good to be true, where, that I love and lived for a few months. Another bit that I fit in here because uh, I'm trying to fill Terry's shoes somewhat, is this work that she's done with the Gitgat First Nation on the west coast of British Columbia. How many of you have heard about the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline? Hands up. <laughs> good, good. So our news has got over to you. So this is, the, this is Douglas Channel, where those tankers, those 300 meter long tankers, are going to have to navigate 200 days a year. Their pathway goes through there. Let me go back there. Do you see how narrow that is? That's only a couple hundred meters across, right? And so making that really steep left turn is no small feat. Um, and then they go down Douglas Channel and out. And I mean, the part of the story that uh, I'm just going to intersect here is, you know, our collective responsibility thinking about oil and gas for the kinds of impacts that hit people. You know, and what Terry has done is it, to investigate the Gitgat First Nations' heavy dependence of their cultural world on the physical world. And the quote that sums it up best is, the ocean is our refrigerator. And I've added on here for the sake of this <laughs> session, and their economy, right? And they actually routinely use this many species in their day-to-day -day existence. And the ones in yellow would be considered cultural keystone species so fundamental to their subsistence and their way of life that the loss of those species would, sh would send reverberations through their cultures. So we've got cockles, crabs, prawns, halibut, herring eggs, salmon, harbor seals, and edible seaweed. Wait, what Terry then did was to characterize three scenarios of what would be lost in the event of a small spill, very predictable, likely to happen, um, over the span of a decade or so, a medium-sized spill and a large spill. And what she found was that even for small spills, some of these cultural keystone species are likely to be lost 
for months, if not much more, 50% or more of the use, right? And when you get up to the large skull scenario, almost all of those species are likely to be lost at those levels of more than 50% for months. So what we're talking about here is not the degradation of something or other. What we're talking about is the destruction of a whole economy, right? We think about economies in terms of trading this for that using money, but they don't think about economy that way. They think about economy in terms of meeting their basic needs and living a good life, right? And that's what these systems offer to them. All right, let's go into plastic, back to the theme of you think about plastic, you might think about flip-flops on a beach, or plastic water bottles, or toothbrushes. But you should be thinking about this poor freshwater turtle whose growth has been completely deformed. It's disturbing how many photos like this you can find online. Or loggerhead sea turtles that mistake plastic bags floating in the oceans for the jellyfish that they rely upon for their sustenance. Or albatrosses with rib cages full of plastic. They've starved them, starved to death because their bellies fill up with the plastic that they mistake for the food that they ought to be eating in the ocean. And it's so bad, I mean, they, can, they transfer that food and the plastic to their young, and you can find the babies like that, sitting on the nest with, you know, rotted out with their rib cages full of plastic waste. So, those stories are stories that have pretty simple causes. We know what to do, more or less. We know what's to blame and what to do differently. There are lots of cases that are a lot more complicated than that, and I don't want to gloss over them, so I'm going to tell you a story about perhaps the most important run of fish anywhere in the world. Certainly the most important run of fish in Canada, and that's the Fraser River sockeye salmon. Up until the 1990s, the mid-1990s, the, the sockeye salmon run was doing quite well. Um, but around 2005, it became clear that the productivity, so the number of fish that come back for every fish that goes up to spawn, was declining pretty, quite markedly. Still, in 2009, 13 million fish were expected to come back up the river. It was supposed to be a banner year based on the projections. What happened over the course of that summer was just devastating one bad news story after another as they monitored how many fish were coming back up. They were expecting to let all of the fishermen have huge catches that year and with all of the cultural and economic, you know, it's a lifeblood of, of these coastal communities when these fish come back. And they didn't open the fishery at first, or rather they closed it because of how bad it was looking and then they kept it closed and they kept it closed every week the salmon were on the front page of the newspapers because whereas ten, over 10 million fish were expected to come back, fewer than 2 million fish did and they didn't open any of the fisheries. It was absolutely devastating. What happened was that the outcry was so great and the media coverage was so great that it sparked a federal inquiry and Justice Cohen led that up. I was at a meeting of salmon and salmon biologists and oceanographers and all kinds of other scientists just a couple of months before this commission. And the idea of this meeting uh, of these salmon scientists was to help Justice Cohen find the smoking gun, right? The thing that was responsible for the 10 million missing fish, as you saw in the headlines, you know, near the end of the summer. As if there was some baddie with thousands of tractor trailers full of the world's most valuable fish, or it's not actually, but close to it, you know, hiding off somewhere in Delta or something, right? It doesn't work that way. You know, they were projected to come back, but they didn't just get stolen. And anybody who knows the life cycle of salmon should be suspicious about language of find the smoking gun. Because what we're talking about is a fish that has a four-year life cycle that starts off in the rivers, they're hatched there as eggs, over winter, sorry, over winter as eggs, hatched there in the spring, swim downstream through the estuaries, out basically to Japan where they turn around and come back and, you know, it's four years later when they come upstream fighting increasingly warmer temperatures. They're all in those waters that, that sometimes kill them. There are all kinds of things that slow these fish down, that impede their growth, that weaken their immune systems and make them more susceptible to predators, right? It's effluent from pulp mills, pollution from all kinds of sources. It's the logging and the sedimentation of the streams 
It's the fish farms in the estuaries and just out as on their migration path out to sea that have viruses and sea lice that can attack those juvenile fish before their scale coat is, makes them resilient to them. It's the ocean's productivity with phytoplankton and zooplankton. And it's you know, all kinds of predators that they encounter en route and then waiting in the estuary as they come up, back up the river to spawn. And then finally, as I said, it's the warmer temperatures in those rivers that uh, make the fungal diseases that attack them on their way up all of the more powerful. So you don't look for one smoking gun in a scenario like that, right? It's like, it's like taking somebody who has died in a firing squad and trying to figure out who was, who was the one who pulled the bullet who actually killed the person, right? It doesn't matter. Because if it wasn't the one bullet, it would have been another, if not immediately, then soon afterwards. And that's how it works with salmon, and it's how it works with lots of other organisms. So the story of the Sockeye River salmon ends with the end of the Cohen Commission, which examined in detail, with lots of lawyers, over 20 suspected causes. It cost $26 million, it was 1,200 pages of text with 75 concrete, very worthy recommendations, but no smoking guns. And because almost everyone involved in this process was expecting to find the one cause that you could blame, the one cause that we could manage and fix everything for salmon, what happened with the 75 recommendations is that they fell on deaf ears entirely. And in terms of real action, that's <laughs> zero. In fact, DFO has gone back on the suggested moratorium and has opened up these areas on the BC coast for more salmon farms, one of those 20 plus suspected causes. The story, the moral of that story, is that environmental problems are almost always multi-causal, right? Interacting causes, working together to undermine these things that we depend upon and cherish. The broader implications of this tour of despair that I've given you so far in my first 10 minutes or so, or not sure how, yeah, 10 minutes, is that it's a small planet. Virtually all of our actions have, environment, are, have environmental consequences. Construction, purchasing, waste, life and career choices, commuting. And virtually all environmental impacts have important human consequences. So environmentalism is every bit a social justice issue as it is an environmental issue. And sustainability becomes an absolute moral imperative. And the third is that proof of impact is a wild goose chase, or a red herring, or both. Because it, you can't pin an impact on one stressor in this world of interacting causes. Because each one, the impact of each of those stressors depends on what else is going on. That's complicated statistically, because with the salmon, we have basically one data point per year, and 20 plus variables varying per year. Anybody who knows science knows that that's not an easily solvable problem. And it's also complicated because it's not static. You can't just change one of those causes, even if it did have a big impact historically, and expect that it's going to solve the problem. So stewardship, then, has to be proactive and adaptive, managing multiple risks simultaneously. It's got to be structured for learning and precautionary. Now on to the economy. What the economy does brilliantly is gives us, us stuff that we like, right? I cherish this computer. You know, I left it up here for the moment as I went to the bathroom, only, you know, with a wince of the possibility that I might lose it. I love it so much, right? But we don't think, when we deal with these things, these things of ours that kind of define our material lives, about the production processes that enable them. This is what's called a source map for a typical laptop computer. What that means is that it takes the sites of extraction of most of the materials that are necessary and then links those to the sites of production of most of the components that are necessary and then links those to the sites of assembly 
and then on to the, the, the final production. So what you see is that a single piece of equipment sitting here on this podium is implicated in environmental issues in so many places. Another thing we have to think about with the economy is the way that it acts almost at any cost and quite quickly, as if, to quote Adam Smith, it operated with an invisible hand. Sometimes this works well, right, for human well-being, and sometimes it doesn't. And a good case of when it didn't is with biofuels, which a decade ago were seen as a really important piece of the climate puzzle. If we could use, say, corn waste or other, you know, even corn ethanol to help reduce gasoline, then the thought was that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the board and help solve the climate problem. So powerful industries lobbied governments in North America and elsewhere for price supports and other kinds of subsidies for biofuels. And that resulted in farmers planting corn for biofuels that they would have planted for human consumption. And what that meant for the price of corn on the global commodity marketplace was more than a doubling over the course of two years, which rippled out to more than tripling for the cost of masa harina and other staples in Latin America, <coughs> which people depend upon for their basic sustenance, their calories. What that meant was food riots in lots of places, um, including quite close to home. And brilliant cartoons like this one here that says, where the rich white businessman says, excuse me, I'm gonna need this to run my car, to the poor um, black guy holding the other end of the cob of corn. We have to remember when we're talking about economic externalities that two to three billion people on this planet still live on less than two dollars a day. I say that because it's critical to remember that when our impacts, when our actions have impacts that ripple elsewhere, other people are often nowhere near as well equipped to deal with the consequences as we are, to adapt to the new circumstances. So, what this means then is that together the environment and the economy are great diffusers of legal rights and responsibilities at the same time that they're aggregators of impacts and so of moral responsibilities. And we need systems to deal with that problem. Small planet systems. With, that incorporate in all of us, whether we like it or not, or are thinking about it or not, small planet ethics. With a new worldwide norm for taking social ecological responsibility, taking responsibility for our environmental impacts and the social consequences of those. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that Elena Bennett was such an important part of um, made this figure, or this logo, quite famous. It's the uh, the Earth House. And what I love about this figure, well, there, there's, I, I could go on, but I won't. Um, one thing that I love about this figure is the way that it represents this idea that the Earth is our house. And I would argue that is small planet ethics, right? If we can treat the whole planet like we treat our own houses, right? Our own sites of dwelling, if we clean up as well as most of us do, not necessarily me, in our own houses, then that's the kind of way that we should treat our planet, and that's sustainable. What's interesting is that economics and ecology share the same Greek root word, oikos, and it means house, right? So there's a nice consilience here across these disciplines. I'm gonna take a bit of a left turn here. Some, some have argued, so I, I also have worked on ecosystem services for the last 10 years. Oh my God, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, with Gretchen Daly, starting when I was a postdoc. And, you know, lots of people have argued that if we could just incorporate the valuation of these ecosystem services, and you see how Elena resisted that. Um, maybe she knew that I was coming afterwards and didn't want me to shoot her down. I wouldn't have. I would have been polite, I promise. 
Some have argued that if you can incorporate the valuation of these ecosystem services, the, these benefits that are impacted, then we can, we can solve all kinds of problems, right? We can give people the answer that Elena said she couldn't give, right, because it's up to them, and let them know what would be best, right? We could do that. We could incorporate full cost accounting and make everybody's decisions just automatically right. And I'm gonna argue that that's actually not so easy. Because valuation is, at its core, always about willingness to pay or willingness to accept. In philosophical terms, that's a normative judgment. And economists have understood or have treated normative judgments like this as a function of preferences, which are assumed for the sake of an economic valuation to be both preformed and also stable. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work like that, as Mark Sagoff pointed out in a paper in Ecological Economics, because actually people are not only creatures of preferences, they also have really strong moral commitments that are principles. And they're not always moral commitments, these principles. But what that means is that whereas in order to make sense of those normative judgments for the sake of economic valuation we have to assume that they're preformed and stable and that they you could have a little less of one for the sake of a little more of another principles complicate that entirely because they don't operate by that logic so mark sagoff called these consumer preferences and citizen preferences i like to call the latter principles because it makes it all the more stark that these aren't like preferences because if you have a strong commitment to strong sustainability, like many of us do in this room, if you're asked a question about how much you're willing to accept for the in extinction of a species, your answer might be infinity, or it might be zero, because that would be com consistent with that principle. Unfortunately, economic valuations take both of those as protest votes and don't include them in the analysis or the aggregation. Similarly, if you believe that there should be no new taxes, like at least 50% of the folks in the States, um, and lots of people in this country too, and you're asked how much you, you would be willing to accept, by, or sorry, would be willing to pay by way of new taxes to prevent extinction, again, you may answer zero, because you don't want any new taxes. And that complicates doing anything with these economic valuations, and I should say, this doesn't apply only to stated preference methods. This is terminology that you're probably not familiar with, but where you ask them explicitly how much they're willing to pay or accept. There's also revealed preference methods where you look and see what people are willing to pay and accept in the marketplace um, through various ways. But the point is, in all of these cases, we cannot generalize the way that we would like to in cost-benefit analysis because of these complications of principles, basically. And the fact that so much of what is environmentally at risk, like with the Gitgat case that I told earlier, are things that you, people cannot and will not put a price tag on. Cultural heritage, cherished ways of life, wildlife, sacred sites, you know, all of those things, people resist putting dollar metrics on. What that means is that cost-benefit analysis can never be complete. You can't have an answer spit out by cost-benefit analysis. It's the beginning, it's helpful. It reveals all kinds of things, but if we don't have a really good concrete conversation about what's not in that figure and how what's not in there might change the answer as to what's desirable and not, then we're gonna miss the right answer. Even full cast accounting is suspect because if we can't incorporate all of the things that are at risk in the cost, then it's not full cost accounting. So, now to switch gears again. What does it take for small planet systems to work well? Well, I'm gonna argue it takes intervening in markets and working with supply chains. I'm gonna start with the Prius as a hybrid car for the sake of pointing out that the problem of lack of traction for environmental issues in the marketplace is not a problem of a lack of goodwill. Millions of people have paid more than $10,000 more for the Prius than they would have for a very similar car of similar quality 
for the sake of owning this kind of, you know, well, for a whole bunch of reasons, but partly for, for the idea that that's the right thing to do, right? And that they can drive around with that kind of badge that they have done what they consider to be the right thing to do. Uh, I, I should say, while I don't have a Prius, I have been strongly tempted to buy one for all of those same reasons. Now, it's important to note that, you know, from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, that's not the cheapest way to accomplish the ends of reducing one's emissions. Actually, if you had $10,000 to spend, you could reduce your emissions a hundred times over through buying credible greenhouse gas offsets. And I say credible because there are some that are credible. There are some that you can actually trust there's something going on, and there are other ones that you can't trust and they're 10 times cheaper. Um, for myself, I trust offsetters. I know that organization, I really like it. I know that what they do is that they actually enable people to do things they would like to do otherwise. They enable communities to build much more efficient skating rinks or swimming pools or libraries or community centers, right? They've got a certain store of capital that they can put in this building and it only enables green performance to a certain level. Offsetters comes in with my money and the money of others and says, if we gave you this much more, how much more could you accomplish? So it goes to good. So the, what does this mean for the environmental movement? Some would argue it means that we've been fighting at this war and there's too little, there's, we've, we're too late. And I'm gonna say, actually, I don't think that's the problem. It's too much, all at once. So what the heck do I mean by that? I mean that what we've got, as you have already seen through my tour of despair in the beginning, is that there's a cacophony of concerns about the environment. And for those of us who aren't here because we're committed to the environment, it is too much to keep track of. Lots of my family, almost all of my family, would consider themselves to be green, if not environmentalists. But they can't keep track of more than three issues, right, and what they should do on them. And for every one of those issues, there's way too much complexity. Too many organizations to keep track of, too many certification labels, too many logos of all kinds, including the imposters and the greenwashers. And then within the guidance, there's too much contention about what to do. So, how many have used a seafood watch card to try to buy seafood in a restaurant? So, lots of you share my pain. <laughs> Walking into a restaurant, wondering what you can eat if you care about this stuff. Asking the waiter where the shrimp is from. Finding out that uh, the answer, you know, the, the, the answer as you need it is whether it's from the US or Mexico or Thailand. And then also whether it was trap caught or trawl caught or, you know. And the answer you get is, um, it, it's, it's from Costco. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew Costco, which, you know, I do know Costco, then I wouldn't know actually that that means I can't eat it, but um, I do buy lots of stuff at Costco, so I'm not going to be a preacher on that. Point is, it's a frustrating experience for all parties, right? Um, less so me than the people in the party with me who are like, can you just order something, please? You know, as I send the waiter back and forth to the kitchen, getting more and more answers about each piece of seafood. Um, anyway, point is, there is a cacophony of com complication here, the least, not the least of which is the fact that if you look at these three seafood watch cards that I just took randomly, you'll find several points of contradiction, right? And you don't know as a consumer what to do in those kinds of scenarios. But more importantly than not knowing what to do are the ways that that kind of contention erode our ability to make decisions subconsciously. Right? In the face of, well, one of them says it's green, one of them says it's red, what am I going to do? It's like most people, without knowing that that's what they're doing, basically say, I, don't, I can't care about that anymore. You know, I'm going to go with what I can care about. This one costs less, that's the one for me. It is absolutely bewildering. And that is paralyzing. In psychological terms, they call this 
decision paralysis or the paradox of choice. Um, where if you have too many choices and the answers, you know, the consequence of those choices are not clear enough, then people just don't act. I mean, you put the same people in a, in a grocery store experiment with six kinds of jam and another one with 12 kinds of jam, and you'll find that actually the people with the six options, the subs, you know, a subset of what was offered in the 12, buy more than twice as many. This is a real psychological effect that in the environmental movement we have completely neglected because we're offering people myriad choices and a complete confusion as to what to do with them. So certification has really come a long way in the last decade. Um, in part because there have been some concerted efforts to unite labels. And the best example of this is the USDA organic label, which is the gold standard. If you don't know, this is the gold standard. Um, now, as to whether it'll stay the gold standard is all entirely up to how politicians respond to Monsanto lobbying, but that's another story. <laughs> Point is that this really helped to unite it because then people could actually find out what it meant when a product was organic, right? They could actually have some reason to believe that they knew what it was about and that somebody was actually checking. And that's great. But when you think, just shout out quite loudly, if you, if you don't mind, what comes to mind when you think of this logo? So the food might be better, it might be healthier, what else? Expensive. Thank you. Very, yeah, it's costly, right? Why does that happen? Organic products are 50 to like 800% more expensive than the parallel conventional products. And it's not because the production is 50 to 800% more expensive. And in fact, production is only a small percentage of what you're actually paying for anyway. What happens with certification is the only way that certification works is through product differentiation. Which means that at every step in the supply chain, Everybody needs to keep it separate in their minds. This is a conventional product, this is an organic product. And in terms of the distribution, there needs to be an entirely different system of distribution for these new products. The store shelves, the store labels, at every single step, what you do is you take the economies of scale that make Costco the place to shop for almost everything that they offer, and you erode it drastically, fundamentally. So certification may not be the answer. What I'm going to propose is something that works quite differently. That actually decouples the change in management environmentally from the product itself. So that if you bought beef in the grocery store, you would be paying for whatever beef you want, just decide on all the things you're used to deciding, and you would also be paying for a suite of greenhouse gas offsets for those community centers and swimming pools and skating rinks, etc. And also a bunch of payments that go to farmers to, pay, to give them the resources in a cost sharing kind of way to do what they want to do anyway. Like putting fences beside streams to keep, to keep their cows' hooves from muddying up and eroding the banks and causing sedimentation and eutrophication downstream, right? <coughs> causing the loss of vegetation and the loss of the riparian habitat for all kinds of biodiversity. If you just do that, you know, those simple actions, you help to provide the funds for farmers to do that, you can actually, and if you do, if you put enough money into that, you can actually be net positive in terms of your impacts on biodiversity associated with that beef and climate change and water quality and soil. So the way that this works is kind of similar to what we call payments for ecosystem services in the field that I work in, but it's importantly different. So payments for ecosystem services work like this. The beneficiary, so imagine that you've got your upstream farmers with their cattle and you've got your downstream folks who are relying on the clean water from those watersheds. Those are your beneficiaries, the downstream folks. And they say, you know, our water quality is getting a lot worse. And this has happened in places, including the Catskills watershed. 
um, no, not exactly in the system, but actually in Latin America, better examples, um, where they said, okay, you know what, we'll pay you guys upstream to do, to put in these fences and to manage the land differently. They pay, try to pay them more than their opportunity costs, and they are almost always only paying the farmers that don't already have fences, for example, right? Because if you're paying the ones who already have fences, what are you paying them for? That's just a waste of money by the economic logic behind this. The problem is twofold. Uh, so, yeah, just to help with that, um, the upstream farmers are those e ecosystem service providers or degraders. Um, and it's the ecosystems, those, you know, riparian strips of vegetation that are providing, are th that are really providing this service. Like, um, it's not the farmers, exactly. But what happens is twofold. Actually, threefold. First, it only works when the beneficiaries actually capture enough of the benefits of those upstream actions, right? So it only really works when Vittel in France was such a major user of the water in the watershed above that they didn't mind the few free riders on, you know, who would benefit from the cleaner water that they were paying for. And the cases in which that happens are quite few. Another problem is that it sends the implicit signal to the farmers upstream that actually they, in, in contrast to what existed before, which was that there was some notion of responsibility for preventing pollution, you're actually sending the signal that they have the right to pollute and the right to be paid not to. Which removes the responsibility and can actually, it has been shown in lots of cases, to backfire in terms of their behavior change. Replacing an incentive that is intrinsic and moral with one that suggests an entirely monetary transaction removes the burden of guilt and makes them less willing to do things. And even sometimes undo things so that they can be paid to put them back. What I'm arguing for is a different approach, a shared stewardship approach, where basically you involve the whole supply chain, since we're all complicit, as I got at earlier, right, with the landslides and the coral reefs and the plastic, etc. We're all complicit in, in these problems, and so we should all share in mitigating. So we're paying for the mitigation of impacts rather than for the benefits. And we do it in a cost-sharing kind of way. And there are lots of examples of this having, well, several, maybe not lots yet, um, including in Australia where they basically did a reverse auction and asked farmers how much they would be willing, how much they would like to be compensated to do things that are stewarding their land. Right? It's a different question. And it involves employing them collaboratively in stewarding the land. So the payments could go to either the providers or to those who are producing on the land or extracting from the land, like the farmers. Um, and the result could be a benefit to the beneficiaries who so often, at least in the developing world, cannot pay for the, you know, farmers upstream to change their practices because they're poor, they're living on less than $2 a day and they've been used to getting water from that watershed for free for their entire lives and for generations before them. So what it also does is it makes governments helpful if necessary, but, you know, kind of unnecessary in the sense that you can move ahead without them. And in a Canadian context, and especially in a BC context, um, it's especially important to find solutions where you're not necessarily waiting on your governments to do everything you want. <laughs> so sharing responsibility, I'd argue, sends the right signal and builds that kind of teamwork that is so, so essential for making good stuff happen. So I'm gonna argue that it's time for that kind of a community to take shape. A conscientious, a community for caring consumption, production, and distribution. Or conscientious consumption, production, and distribution. And one of my colleagues suggested that it should be, uh, when I had it as caring consumers, producers, and organizations, he suggested it should be C-3PO, but I thought that that would be sticky in a way I didn't intend. And so at the moment, we're going with C-3.3.
And the idea is to make Project Beef happen, right? So the idea, so let me go back actually for a second. So um, I've actually been talking with folks in grocery stores and, and they're actually quite interested in the idea of this kind of a program where it would just be the norm for everyone. Either it would be opt out at the, at the cashier register, you'd have to say, no, I don't care about those BC, BC farmers and, you know, and environmental sustainability, I'm not paying for anything. Or it would just be built into every cost. And some of the, the major grocery store chains are willing to entertain this because the local connection and the idea of paying farmers to stay on the land and do good things is really resonant with their, with their consumers. Um, so the idea is just to build it in there so that just as a matter of course you're contributing to good things and you feel better about it. And the idea of C3.3 is to do that everywhere with all kinds of different levers. And I, I don't have the slides to walk through how and why exactly that would work, but basically you, can, you have points of intervention everywhere. You've got your caring consumers who can lobby their retailers right, to get, to bring this kind of an approach in. You've got your retailers who then work with the folks up the supply chain to bring it in, and, you know, and so on, and so on, and so on, with a ripple effect. And so, you know, I started with that idea of how do we get big, right? How do we scale up from the watershed to the whole world? And this is how I would argue you do it. You use the market in this kind of a cooperative way where a transaction is not just a market transaction, but also a moral transaction. And you do it in a way that leverages the supply chain. So for tropical hardwood, this could mean paying folks in Haiti and Indonesia for forest restoration, for the protection of forests on steep slopes to pre prevent the sedimentation and the destabilization of those slopes that cause those landslides, for protected areas to augment the simple addition of buffers, hedgerows and trees and farmland for the sake of biodiversity, um, and vegetation buffers around stream for the sake of reducing impacts on water quality and also coral reefs. In the case of oil and gas, it looks lo like those greenhouse gas offsets that I talked about earlier. Um, and I'm committed to that. I totally believe it. I know that there is, there's a little bit of, you know, some people get paid to do things that they would have done anyway, but I don't mind that actually, right along the lines of sending the right signal. I, I want people to try to do as much as they can, and I don't mind if, you know, I have to pay twice as much to get that, and that's the economist's argument against that kind of, you know, these kinds of systems. Um, they have worked poorly in some cases, as I said, and it's important to know what's credible, but you know, I commit to paying for offsets for every trip that I take, and I'll pay for this one too if, uh, if, the fund, if the organizers won't pay for it for me, because it's just the right thing to do. And with plastics, we can pay folks in all kinds of places for beach and river cleanups to get the plastic out of their rivers and lakes and oceans. We can pay them to help contain waste better in landfills, to set up recycling programs in places that don't have them. We can pay people to do wildlife rescue and rehabilitation operations, and we can pay for ocean cleanups, perhaps if that ever comes cost effective. And we can do that for the sake of mitigating the impacts that we are unwittingly and unwillingly contributing to by our everyday purchases and ways of life. Sometimes doing a little less harm makes people hopeful, and sometimes, I'm gonna argue, it takes a big, bold vision. And I wanna tell you a story about how that kind of a big, bold vision could actually be realizable. I bring it into this conversation because of the exchange about trade-offs before, you know? Like, yeah, it's true, there are rarely win-wins at the margin, I would say where you can do something small that will make everybody better off. But I'm gonna argue that sometimes you can find these solutions that are beyond trade-offs. What I mean by that is that they involve everybody giving something up for the sake of later on downstream benefits for lots of people, including future generations and including the non-human world. Tasman Bay in New Zealand is uh, a, a beautiful bay. You can see it from the air as I was flying in um, from Auckland. It, uh, it looks absolutely gorgeous to me, but what I found out later is that tinge of brown is sedimentation. And we, um, 
we did an expert workshop with uh, Cawthron Institute, which is a great partner, and we found out working with s stakeholders all across the sectors and the government agencies, etc., that for almost everybody, sedimentation was on their brain. This bay had been the site of a really productive oyster fishery with natural oyster beds there and lots of nat natural mussel beds. Um, after the oyster reefs were pretty much fished out and also sedimented out by logging on steep slopes like you would never believe. I could not believe it coming from BC where at least we hide it when we you know, do it with these buffers on roadways. Um, logging on steep slopes, the intensification of agriculture for grazing, for export, etc. Those things have contributed to major sedimentation that undermine the ability of these shellfish to exist. And then, you know, there was a, a scallop fishery that was vibrant up until a decade ago, and scallops are a lot more resilient to sedimentation than our oysters and mussels, but they too became overfished and also undermined in a way that that fishery is to, has been destroyed. And so this bay that looks so beautiful and so pristine is not that. And the people are anxious for solutions. But what they didn't realize, when, when we had this expert workshop, nobody mentioned the fact that actually, with the oyster beds, if we could get back oyster beds in the scale that we had them, and muscle beds, and if we simultaneously reduce sedimentation from those various land-based sources and also from trawling that is not sustainable, then we could recreate a bay with shellfish that is abundant and that also breaks down this positive feedback cycle that is currently happening, where the sandy bottoms, without those oyster beds and those muscle beds that trap the sediment, enable the constant resuspension of that sediment. Right? Continually undermining the productivity of their fisheries. So, what I'm arguing is that better and wilder looks like the active restoration. Everybody giving up something for the sake of this vision for the future that is richer, better in so many ways, and wilder in the sense of working with natural ecosystem services. Um, from my perspective, uh, this was a great field trip. And like I said, the bay is really gorgeous. I mean, this was, this was our, our field work on, on one of those beaches. It was, it's a fun place to be. So back to chamber pots. The point isn't that 20th century plumbing is the be all and end all, right? The point isn't that, that it's perfect and that everybody ought to have the system that we have. The point is only just that it's a heck of a lot better than nothing. And at the moment, we have nothing environmentally to reduce this cacophony of everybody trying to operate in the same space with this, you know, noisy set of ideas. And we can do better, and you guys can help. And if you're interested in that idea of C3.3 that I mentioned before, and I'd love to tell you more about it, you can join on as a consumer, pledging that if <coughs> such a system were available, that you would actually do this kind of thing. You would take responsibility for your social ecological impacts. You can be a messenger about it, spreading the word via social media, Twitter, for example, um, you can be an enabler. You can help get your organization or your company to get involved. Or you can be a co-constructor. Help us figure out how this ought to work, because there's a lot to be figured out. And I would love for your help to make this go viral. So just to go back through that whole chain of arguments, because I, you know, in introducing me, Peter went through ecology and evolutionary biology and ethics and policy, <laughs> and you know, and, and in this talk, I basically covered all that territory, right? So we started off with thinking about the multi-causal nature of social ecological problems and you know, and the human face of environmental problems. We talked about the power of markets and the danger of externalities and the need to get those in hand. We talked about valuation and how while it's helpful, it's not the be all and end all and we can't rely on full cost accounting or cost benefit analysis. We talked about the cacophony of environmental concerns and campaigns and contention. And then we talked about the possibility of a shared stewardship approach that could just spiral outwards globally. And that helped us think about solutions to all those problems. So that's C3.3. To wrap it up, it's time for small planet ethics. Our responses thus far have been great in so many ways, but they've also been disparate and discordant, and it's time to unite them. 
What I'm proposing here is not a new solution. It's just a way of integrating across the current ones that exist. So join us in any capacity or just throw tomatoes and jumpstart something else that also thinks big. Thank you very much. Question regarding shared stewardship and globalization. Um, I really think for a lot of these things, it's easier for us to take care of it if we can see it in our own backyard. And with so much globalization, buying t shirts for four up bucks, things like that, it, it's very difficult to include this Walmart, Costco, Costco bottom price, cheapest. So there's a large part of the population engaging in this kind of shopping behavior. So how do we either bring it closer or do we encourage more local purchasing or how do we do it to bring it closer to people to really, so they can see what's happening. I recently saw that 60% of Chinese groundwater is contaminated. Well, we wouldn't accept that if that was in Muskoka or Toronto or we wouldn't accept it here. Yeah, so absolutely. how do we go forward? Yeah, thank you for that question. So. The point about this solution is that you don't need to get 100% of consumers on board for this to work. You actually only need the tipping point, right? You need to work with enough of them and civil society organizations to persuade the retailers and the rest of the supply chain. And sometimes that's actually a lot easier, right? So in part, you could think of this kind of an idea as helping a company like Walmart to streamline its management of environmental risks, right? So companies like this are actually vulnerable at the level of their brand to, be, to having this perception that they are, you know, devils incarnate, right? And, and if it gets that bad, then it can impact them to the tune of billions of dollars, and it's the kind of thing they're actually quite concerned about. So, so there really is the possibility of working with organizations such that you, don't, you only need to persuade the 10% that you're likely to be able to reach. You don't have to reach the 90% that you almost can't persuade to care about this litany of issues. So, you know, I mean, some people, yeah, absolutely, we can make it more transparent. And, you know, I, I know about a bunch of different uh, programs that allow you to see the face of the farmer from whom you bought your coffee kind of thing. Like, we can make that a lot more transparent to connect our day-to-day -day decisions to the consequences else, elsewhere. But, you know, as much hope as I have for that, for the 10%, I don't think it has a whole lot of hope for the 90% that will follow if we make it easy. Thank you for that uh, presentation. How much confidence do you have when you buy offsets that the money gets into the right hands and gets used for the right purpose? Because I know this company and I've tracked them over the last few years, I have a lot of confidence. Um, and you know, if I if I have a question or a complaint, then I I I know who to go to. Um, and I know both of the founders really well. Um, and. You know, and there is a gold standard for offsets, and I would say, you know, and, and like I said, I mean, they're on the order of ten dollar, ten times more expensive than the uh, than the ones that you can't necessarily trust. But I would say that you can have quite a strong degree of confidence. What I would also say is that, you know, every every kind of deal has some, you know, has some leakage, basically, right? And that's what I was saying earlier. Like in some cases. Some of these projects involve paying people to do something that they're pretending they wouldn't have done otherwise, but they really would have. And, and like I said, you know, I actually I don't mind that a little bit. As long as that's not the lion's share of it, as long as it's not more than 50%, I'm totally fine with that. You know, because it's, it's almost impossible to make a program like that work. And I can reduce my greenhouse gas emissions a lot more cheaply that way than I can you know, saying no to trips like this. Oh, go ahead. I uh, believe um, I heard you say that full cost accounting uh, was not uh, particularly uh, useful because uh, you cannot account for all the costs. I wonder if I can ask you to uh, expand on that a little bit, knowing that your questioner, I guess, isn't sure that you need to have to account for all the costs to make the, the concept of accountability uh, 
worthwhile. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I meant to clarify what I meant by that. Um, instead, I just left it with a very provocative stub. Um, so, I didn't actually say they weren't that full cost accounting wouldn't be useful. I said it was suspect because it, it won't ever be full cost, right? So I'm not saying it wouldn't be useful. And and if we think of costs in the sense of paying for the mitigation of the impacts as opposed to paying for the compensation of the folks who are losing stuff, then it becomes quite different in my mind, right? If we're paying as you know, in the case of greenhouse gases and climate change, if we're paying people to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, that's a payment for mitigation, right? As a payment for, as opposed to a payment for co of compensation to the GitGat people for destroying their economy, right? Like, in my mind, that's just not conscionable, and that's, like, if that's what the full cost accounting means, then I don't want anything to do with it, right? But if we're talking about the mitigation, then I think that almost full cost accounting, which is what, you know, it'll never be called, but that's how I'll always think about it, would be great. And effectively, you know, what I'm talking about with C3 would basically lead to that, right? Because what it would do, if, if these ideas of taking social ecological responsibility did permeate through the supply chain, then it would be not, it, not just individuals, in fact, not primarily individuals, but it would be companies and organizations and even governments of all shapes and sizes paying for the mitigation of the things that are, you know, acknowledged externalities of their actions. And so they would be incorporating it into the cost of doing business, right? And so it would effectively be almost full cost accounting. But in order to be provocative, I just left it up there as saying that it was suspect. suspect. Thank you. It's good to be provocative.